Okay, three, two, one. Oh, we are recording. Uh, I'm back. I'm back with uh, Joseph. Joseph, how are you today? I'm good. Pretty good, at least. How cool, are you? cool, cool. I am. I'm well. I'm well. No, no complaints. I started seeing a chiropractor recently. That's uh, a new addition to to my life. My my wife uh, got me into it. So I don't know. A bit, 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 bit unsure. <laughs> Was, do, you, do you have any experience with chiro or? I I actually like I dislocated my shoulder like in like grade 11 or something like playing okay. basketball or something and you so. saw one yeah yeah, yeah and it yeah. helped or it's, not really it's good Did but you... like if you don't keep it up it uh like it goes you, know, you have to like constantly yeah so it's it doesn't go back but it's like you need to constantly go to them and so um it's like a good and bad you did right? sign like, me once... up for a long-term plan so <laughs> i bet yeah <laughs> that's it. it's perpetual now i was so, doing the math on it afterwards i was like should i be looking into cairo or something yeah. you know <laughs> like a little bit of a, a detour a, anyways yeah, okay right? so just just to get a level up here uh so this is going to be our third episode uh mm-hmm. you know maybe as a disclaimer to it should be noted you know so joseph who's the founder of you know pay case and shift is also a uh a sponsor of this show so you know yeah <laughs> you guys so, th- so thank you actually i'm on episode you know 90 almost 100 and you Amazing. know if people do enjoy this show they've got you know joseph and, and then on the other side Sutvik on the other side of the world that's kind of helping make it possible so so thank you on that front joseph really appreciate it man. it's been a lot of fun and i think people have been enjoying it i don't know i don't know we'll see okay and you and, and oddly you've also been you know out of all the interviews one of the more popular ones so um i don't know why that is i, hope I, that's I find a it a bit surprising <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no i'm kidding but, uh, reg isn't the most exciting topics but uh but nobody's yeah. talking talking about it right it fun. so that's maybe true. that's why maybe that's why nobody's really talking about it in a way that's at least a bit kind of fun and, and whatever okay so so we so in our first episode we did like the whole and people they can i'll put the links in there right so people can go back and rewind and, and learn about you know your story and the crazy crazy things in like the, in peru and it's awesome i love that story and then and in our second episode we kind of laid down the framework for for shift right which has been this project that you and the team's been working on for almost three years that's been i think you know a very very interesting interesting project in its development i, I always look at shift as like probably the most like counterintuitive kind of opportunity or project that i've ever seen heard of been a part of and so um it, so it does take a bit of you know you gotta put your thinking hat on right to really yeah. kind of walk through this and that's when i what i wanted to you know, there's a lot of stuff I wanted to go into, right? We're going to, we want to talk a bit about like, why I want to dig a bit deeper into like, you know, why are we doing this? You know, why are you doing this really? Like, how did you guys come up with this project? How is it in line with the ethos? Um, If we didn't, or you didn't do this, what might that mean in terms of potential like bans and governments, you know, acting perhaps even more hastily towards it? Um, I want to talk a little bit about maybe roadmaps, things like that. Uh, We'll dig in in terms of the Federation, um, you know, there were some new guidelines put up uh, by FATF. I'm sure people are racking their brains over what's what does that mean? What do, how does that impact our industry? You know, is it a threat? It's uh, you know, what what is it? What is it? How how do people navigate this this confusing space? Um, and then you know, also another thing that that, that keeps coming up is well, you know, what what's shift? How is it different from other projects out there? You know, and what and yeah. and then last but not least, if people stick around for the whole whatever hour and a half, we're gonna talk about something that again is a bit of a counterintuitive thing but i think you know a lot of people are waking up to this notion of compliant DeFi, right which which is going to be um at least i think a a very very big deal especially with institutions coming in okay so let's get started let's start maybe with the why and i know we did a whole hour and a half on it i don't want to you know Mm -hmm. like go to go to lengths with it but i do want to at least touch on you know again a bit on like you know what was it that what was the incentive behind it because a lot of people you know their, their their initial reaction is don't work with regulators like don't help them to regulate right i mean i'm, I'm just calling yeah. out the pink yeah, elephant no. right like come on it's let's true. Let, let's start to the deep end here right? <laughs> so so why, why 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 would one even think about that and, and yeah. obviously i have some counter you know context i want to give afterwards but go ahead first yeah no like I think being in the space for so long, like, and, and you and I both know this, like, intimately, right? Like, the early days, we were like, we're invincible, like, we're untouchable, you know, like, Bitcoin can't be stopped, you know, and I think that, like, that narrative is, like, you know, one that gets us as far as it has. 
you know, but like, I think once you've been here for a while, you start to recognize, you know, there, I don't want to say there's flaws in that argument, but like, there are like certain realities that like exist around us as humans, right? Like, and so, and like our philosophy was like in 2014 and 15, we were building exchanges, you know, we couldn't get banking, we couldn't get like taxation rights, like, and this is where we started realizing like, okay, wait, so there's like these intersections with the real world that don't work with the space. And there are things that have to get addressed and tackled in order to actually make things work, right? Um, and like when the rubber hits the road, like is where you start realizing, okay, yeah, like Bitcoin, you know, doesn't care about regulations. It really doesn't. The protocol doesn't care. It doesn't care about what we think, what you think, what I think. It doesn't care. It continues on. But we as like humans in the systems that we live in today, at least, whether we like them or not, they need, they, they have, you know, requirements and we have to somehow, you know, interoperate with those. Um, and so like being early in the space, we kind of recognize like there were these hurdles that no one could get through. And, you know, it's like on the backs of a lot of that early work that some of these things have been sorted out. And, you know, and of course it's evolutionary. Um, and like the one thing that we looked at was like, okay, this compliance thing was deactivating our ability to get banking and every com business and company in this space always felt this, right? Like we looked at, like we were money launderers. We looked like we were criminals. We were getting calls from the FBI. Like we were getting pretty ridiculous requests, you know, early on in the space. And it's like, that is a unsustainable B it's not true. How do we educate and how do we kind of, you know, solve this like big conundrum that we have. Um, and the one way to do it is, you know, you fight against regulators. The other way is to say, listen, we can educate, we can work together here to at least teach what is and isn't right uh, and what is like factually incorrect and what to be worried about. More importantly, how to define risk because all that regulatory, like regulators and policymakers do, they are risk analysts and they write regulations based on where they view risk to be, right? Whether we believe that there's risk there or not, that's a separate question that's what governments are there to do is help eliminate or ease risk. Um, and so like the why is that like, we recognized early on, we're like, okay, like it is all fun and games, but the moment that this gets serious, like we're gonna have a serious issue and it stops being fun and games. And at what point does that become a reality that, that the new entrants in the space have to deal with? And so like, we kind of took this approach where we're gonna do the opposite of every person in our ecosystem, early Bitcoin OGs, like very early adopters of the space. We're gonna take a different approach. We're gonna maintain that thesis of decentralization and privacy and openness. But like, we need to address the elephant, as you said, in the room, which are the people that write the rules that govern our lives. And if we don't do that, no one else will. And we're in a situation kind of like, unfortunately, we are with this new regulation or guidance that's come out of the FATF this week. Um, it's getting real and it's becoming like we're starting to see like a, a beginning of like a war against our space in a lot of different ways. And it's on the privacy front. It's on the financial front. Like there's there's a lot of things happening that most people probably don't see right now. Um, but this was it. Sorry, sorry. Let, let's talk about the um, that that guidance because I I don't I mean I know there's a lot of buzz about it and people know something's up, but but um, yeah, let's maybe just as you know as Bitcoiners, right? As people who have been in this space for what ten years now, you know we obviously we obviously love Bitcoin, we love privacy, we love you know sovereignty, we love freedom. You know we're we're in this space building businesses, enabling others to get into it, like millions of people at scale uh so obviously we want to see this this space thrive but uh but uh, yeah maybe yeah just break it down i know we talked about again oecd and fatif and all that people can go back to the old interview but just again give people a bit of context mm. because i don't think a lot of people even know like that there are these regulators of regulators <laughs> these people that as i called them you know on on un, un, what is it called elected officials that you know essentially get to make rules that change our lives for the better or worse it is what it is and this is my thing about yeah. bitcoiners i feel that a lot of them i love them i love their like hardcore stance but sometimes i feel like like you've got to meet the world where it's at right and yeah. and so fatif is as real as it gets like we're talking like post world war ii type of deal like this was a, an alliance that was created by countries to do what to uh, yeah. to essentially set forward a path to rebuild, was it Europe or, uh, but then yeah, but the then OECD kind of, was, yeah, the OECD. The OECD and, and so, so, yeah. so these, these are the people that, that regulate the world to some extent, the financial yeah. world. So, so what, what, what happened uh, recently with this new guideline? What does it mean? Um, yeah. yeah. So like FATF is like an interesting thing because like 
yeah, they're not a democratic body. It's not like it's it's defined by any one country. It is a standard setting organization. You know, their their job is to regulate and monitor the financial systems of the world. Like in no time in history has like a technology industry had to go head to head with, you know, in most cases, like these types of organizations. This is like a new one. Of course, there's been like arguments in the privacy side of, of the early parts of the Internet and stuff like that. But like this one is fundamentally different. And like when it comes to financial flows the world's largest economies do not mess around like you know and when it comes to money laundering and terrorist financing like these things are are real and uh whether they're big threats or small threats this is like you're hitting the world economies in the worst place to be very honest so like their ability to swing back is big and they have a lot of uh ammo let's call it uh, to exercise you know what they believe to be geopolitical um uh, stability requirements effectively and, so and, and fundamentally yeah. though joseph what does that mean for let's say little old business man woman in some country trying to start a bitcoin business it means that they might ultimately not get banking if they don't play by the rules is that is that what yeah. we're talking about or is are we talking i think like it's, jail it's term worse or like yeah like, and, and like yeah, 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 yeah 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 like that it's worse right like the uh, like the hard thing is like when it comes to finance, like illicit activity, you can really blanket a lot of things like bans become something that makes sense. They become OK. Right. Like you can ban Bitcoin. You could have. Yes, people can be literally held liable on a personal level for like interaction with systems in some capacity or the development of systems in this capacity. So like developers now become potential targets um, of illicit you know, money laundering flow activity uh, and like enforcement and like that's where like things start to really get real and it's you know you can you can kind of see a world where privacy and like certain parts of like human rights kind of fall to the wayside because you're saying that there is counterterrorism requirements that supersede that right and now it's becoming at the individual level the private key holder you know this the the dow um organizer the smart contract developer like these are the in the re most recent fad of stuff which i can get into in a second that's where we're going and it's becoming the onus is being put on us as individuals which has never been the case traditionally in the financial system like they always regulate intermediaries they enter they they were there to like regulate ex like com like companies like not people but what this is doing now is like we're moving into a world where people are like the topic of discussion and that's like scary like that is a really draconian world right um does that kind of make sense? Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, uh, but why is that? What's the impact? Like, what's the yeah. um, what's the incentive? Like, what what are they? Like, yeah, why are they doing that? Is it so just because think, of the nature of our industry, or just they're yeah. they're afraid that like smart contracts and like are we okay? What like let okay. So so if we had to, if you are you are you saying that okay? If, what are you saying? So what does this guideline mean for the average person? Okay. Does it mean that they cannot? eventually is there a system that's going to be in place or soon to perhaps be in place that might make it difficult for centralized exchanges to send or users of centralized exchanges to send their crypto to their own let's say trezor or some smart contract or whatever is that what we're talking about here uh because just like with the average guy right what does this mean yeah yeah like what it means is like governments don't are, are worried about our ecosystem. They think that it's expanding very quickly and they need to put in safeguards to, to, to reduce that acceleration. That's like the core thing here, right? So um, what it means is they need to get a better handle on identification of people involved in financial transactions. How do I, you know, a withdrawal out of an exchange? Well, the, this puts in the, the question of, are, should you be allowed to withdraw from an exchange? Like, so if I can't send money in and out of an exchange, the regulations or the guidance here actually says that if countries deem necessary, do not allow withdrawals or deposits in and out of exchanges. So in that world, you can see, I can't send to a P2P wallet, I can't send to a wallet on my phone. So like the idea of blocking P2P um, uh, centralized exchanges becomes real. And like the liquidity flows become uh, harder to move than how we have our space today. That's like one example. Um, and what it means for the users is like, yeah, they are they are expecting KYC across all of our wallets in some capacity. What they're saying is like, and I can walk through the guidance maybe more just to give some more background in, in a second. But basically, what we're faced with today is this concept of they want to de-anonymize the pseudo anonymity of cryptocurrency transactions as much as possible. 
right? Um, you know, flows in across borders, like that's generally a registered function. And so we're breaking that system through crypto. They want to eliminate that ability. Um, they want to make sure that they can monitor and transact and like and track as many people as possible. Um, and they want to also put the onus on the developers that are in charge of building systems and say like, if you are a developer, if you've built, you know, Uniswap, okay, we're going to say that you're a money service business. You are under VASP or, you know, uh, KYC requirements. And anything that happens on Uniswap, as an example, is under your problem. So like we can run enforcement against you, the developers of a Uniswap or some other exchange, like whoever it might be, um, or a wallet or a lending protocol. And this is where the DeFi arena gets really messy um, because like, you know, how does that work? It becomes almost impossible. Um, and of course on the centralized exchanges, it's a bit more clear. Uh, it's again, it's, it's, they're beefing up their approach to it, making it look more like banks. They're, they're eliminating the advantages that digital assets and cryptocurrency businesses have against the financial system right now. Um, so they're kind of trying to, you know, bring it back to a level playing field, um, which doesn't help consumers. Like, you know, if, if I can get better rates and lending and stuff in the crypto space, why would I ever go to a bank? Well, they're trying to make it really tough to be able to make that decision, right? Uh, and that comes with privacy questions or violations, potentially like human rights questions, you know, freedom, a lot of different attributes um, and privacy is something that just gets eliminated from this. So you're muted. This is a terrible thing, no, for like humans in yeah. general. Like if you're, if someone's listening to this, they're probably just like, that's awful. Uh, or to some extent, right. Uh, Cause people probably <laughs> value privacy and, and, and I think the general narrative is, is that like, you know, does KYC even help with uh, fighting these these crimes? So before we move on to like the kind of the more, you know, other topics, yeah. but just curious, what if the average person is hearing this and they're just like, yeah. this sucks. How does one like stand up against these forces or, you know, or if they don't believe or do they, what do they do? Like, <laughs> yeah. And, and so like, let me just be clear, like this is proposed guidance. Um, the FATF is a group of like 36, you know, around 36 countries. They propose guidance that then goes to the countries who are expected to uh, respond to that guidance by writing regulation, right? So that's the process. So this doesn't mean this is 100% happening in every place. No one's going to say no to it. This is just giving the toolbox to all regulators in the world to say, now you have almost unbounded ability to do all these things. If it if you deem it to be risky, right? P2P transactions, if it's too risky, you can block them out of withdrawing exchanges. Uh, you know, DeFi, if it gets too big, it gets too uh, risky, you can take these measures. So that's like what we're dealing with. Um, so like there's a comment period that's open now, um, which a lot of us are responding to. We're speaking with the FATF uh, over the next few months to try to um, you know, address some of the questions. Uh, if anyone wants to uh, respond to these uh, these proposed guidance, which is what they're asking, it's a public consultation. Uh, they have until the 20th of April, which isn't a lot of time, um, but it's uh, that's something. Is that effective or not? Do they really listen? Well, we'll see. Well, uh, you never know. Like it, this seems to be a situation where they wrote this very in depth approach because they already knew what they were trying to accomplish so um and i can walk through what the the new guidance says too if we want but uh but yeah it's a there's a fundamental change coming to the world and our ecosystem and we need to be able to, to address it and so whether it's you know being vocal on twitter helps too right like people just being educated and being able to respond to these things and work as an ecosystem is like critically important right now it's probably the most important thing we've ever had to deal with in the ecosystem. Uh, this will affect every user participant, no matter the country, no matter like what your stance on privacy is, this like fundamentally can impact every piece that we've built for the last 10 years. Um, and yeah. that's like big. So Yeah. And, and you know, and just for whatever it's worth um, in the court case a year ago that we were in in India, one of the five points was, 
that, you know, there wasn't a proper international kind of assessment and an adherence to, to the regulatory frameworks that were being presented by FATF and, and mm. entities of such. And so I, you know, as an entrepreneur, whether I like it or not, like we literally saw that the fact that FATF wasn't choosing to ban it, it was choosing to kind of, you know, regulate, I mean, for better or worse, was kind of worked in, in, in favor to some extent. Um, but, but at the same time, you know, it sounds like being stuck between like a rock and a hard place. Okay. So I guess this is, this is maybe a nice segue back into, so given this, like, not so amazing, uh, maybe, uh, you know, situation we're in, how does shift perhaps offer like why why I mean, and, I'm, and i think i'm allowed to mention right the binance and, and a lot of these because it's on coindesk that the, these guys have recently yeah. chosen to partner with shift so what why is it that all these like major mm-hmm. exchanges around the world are are partnering with it was shift and, and maybe let's just segue into that like so yeah you know, what, what where did the you know i know we talked about it in detail before but like just for quickly maybe you know where did that insight come from and let's maybe yeah talk a bit yeah, about how it solved some of these problems so the the track like the this whole fat of thing is not new to the centralized exchanges right like if it's uno coin or binance or bitfinex or tether like we've actually all been dealing with this on behalf of the ecosystem as the biggest exchanges in the world for the last almost two years right so while it might be new to an introduction into DeFi or p2p and everyone's starting to hear about this like really recently like this has actually been a problem that we've been working towards for almost two years so we've been in development trying to solve these challenges at least for the centralized exchanges um and so that started since about 2018 2019 um and so the big exchanges we all kind of came together early on and said we need a solution here that doesn't destroy privacy that doesn't destroy decentralization if you think about compliance it centralizes all these transaction processes. That's what that's what compliance is there to do. Centralize everything and determine whether or not transactions are good or bad, right? That's the job of compliance. Users in the crypto world don't deal with this. It's in the back of an exchange. No one really knows what's happening. Um, and so it doesn't affect us as users, generally speaking, until now, this might change. Um, and so like the exchanges are tasked with kind of not rebuilding Swift. No one wants to rebuild Swift. That's the whole point It's like, <laughs> you know, not destroy the financial system, but upgrade the financial system. Like what's the point in all these things if we're just rebuilding a nonprofit organization that just is involved in all this data transmission? Uh, Like the point of Bitcoin is to make an open free financial system, right? And and that's like what we all came here to build. Um, And like, so we need sovereignty and users to still be in control, exchanges to be, you know, on their own and open to do their own transactions. Uh, And of course that goes into DeFi, it goes into P2P, it goes into everything. Um, and so what we've been trying to do with the, the biggest exchanges is, is to build a system that maintains privacy and openness and allows that same type of freedom to occur while also solving the problem. Um, and that's a tough like problem to solve. Like you have data sharing requirements, GDPR requirements, you have privacy considerations, you have all these things um, that you have to solve. So Shift is like an on-chain smart contract based solution that allows Uh, any counterparty to discover one another. I'm Binance, I'm sending transactions to Bitfinex um, and allows those users on those exchanges to be a part of that transaction process and ensure that security across my data and ownership of data and and transaction agreement is held and controlled by users and the exchanges can solve their problem. Um, So that's like a high level, like, I guess, uh, approach to like solving it. Um, And we took a very different approach, right? Like, we didn't believe that, you know, creating a central database and, and a closed repository where we were the dictators of who should be allowed into the system versus not uh, was acceptable, right? And that's what Shift Swift is. Like Swift is a solution to that, uh, and they use that for the financial system. And so we need to keep something open. And so the biggest exchanges in us have been working for the the rest of the ecosystem to ensure that we have an open system that's free for everyone, um, because if we don't the world starts to re-centralize, it becomes another financial system. You have people that are um, not allowed into that financial system. Uh, you start blocking the, the on-ramps and openness that makes you know, Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies beautiful. And I, that, I can't see a world where that makes sense. So that's kind of the, the focus today. Got you, got you. And by the way, I think we may have touched on this, but you were at one point an advisor to the OECD, right? Or something like that? Mm-hmm. 
and, uh, and yeah. I believe some of the um, advisors to this project are they're like former FATF advisors, right? Or FATF, um, what, what were they? Yeah. Sorry, yeah. And so, so how, first of all, how, how did, how did um, well, maybe we'll save that for, for another one, but I was curious, like, how did that even happen, right? How do you become the advisor for uh, something like that? <laughs> that must have been. <laughs> I mean, like we were Long trying to story. solve our own. Yeah, well, like we were trying to solve our own problems in Canada, um, and then like we had, you know, we met people in Australia, and they were also having this issue. And regulators are like, "We don't know what to do with you guys. Like, we we need some guidance here." And then like one thing led to another, and you know, everyone's moving around, and um, certain people were moved to the OECD. I at the time had no idea what the OECD even was, only to find out it's like the most powerful research and like policy. It's like the policy and research arm of like the G20 and like they make the research decisions that dictate how society functions to most of the world um at least in the western world uh and they're an incredibly powerful underlying um information center i would say um and that has its advantages it has its disadvantages um but kind of like it was it wasn't it was not um it was more of like just a random series of events but it all came down to this piece of like regulators are people they're not inherently bad they don't want to kill us all but they don't have the information our industry isn't all that good at teaching in some capacities at least speaking the way that you know traditional people in those positions need to be spoken to you know and if like, you don't have that information like you know in in a symmetrical place if there's information asymmetry you're going to get regulations and policy that destroy everything. And you get people who are scared of what we're building, killing things because they don't want to deal with it. They don't want to touch it. Central banks are scared. Like, you know, they're, they're looking at this thing saying, no, this is not okay. Ban, block everything, like shut down openness, shut down the privacy side of this. That's what's happening right now. Right. And, and our industry needs to respond and quickly. And so that's where it came from is like, we recognize that if we didn't start now, and this was in 2016, um, if we didn't start providing research now, they would effectively just go right to bans. They wouldn't, they wouldn't take the time to look at what are the areas that we as governments need to focus on. We can't kill the technology. We have to change its structure, which is how they, what they think. I personally don't agree with that. I think that that's the nature of, of openness is everything and privacy is fundamental, but governments don't listen to everything that we say. Um, so what's the balance? Like, how do we draw the balance, right? Like, what is that? Um, and the KYC side, you're never gonna get a, a government to just say, no more KYC. We don't, we don't believe the trend, like terrorist financing doesn't exist. They see these things, whether it's a lot or small amounts uh, in an ecosystem is relevant. That's what they believe. You're not going to get rid of that. You're always going to have this requirement, at least for now, of like KYC is needed. So we have to enforce it. Um, but there's things that like aren't required, right? Um, there's the questions around privacy and when does that become an overreach? There's a lot of stuff here that like you need to push and strike a balance with. Um, and so we tried to do that at the OECD. Um, and then, of course, that led to the FATF. Um, and it led to a lot of I'd say collaborative intergovernmental organization work and research that the G7, G20 are currently uh, taking on and carrying on. Um, and to the extent that we can be helpful to the ecosystem as being a voice, like that's kind of what we're doing now. So interesting. And, and so um, there was a couple other things I wanted to just quickly touch on. Um, so, so that was one. So in terms of the guidelines themselves, was, was there anything else you wanted to share? Because I thought that was a pretty important development, I guess you could say, since our last uh, chat. And and I want I know a lot of people are curious about it. And so was there anything else you wanted to share before I switch gears? Uh, I mean, like, I think there's probably like two or three really core concepts that people take away, right? Uh, this is the first time that you've really seen regulate global policy that will be coordinated across almost every jurisdiction likely in the world. Basically take the position that us as humans are now VASPs. We're virtual asset service providers. Um, if you are a key signer of a contract, a smart contract, a DAO, a DEX, an upgradability piece to a DeFi or DAP, you are now a money transmitter. Uh, if you are a developer of those in those source codes, if you're there to get any type of profit, i.e. the LPs in a liquidity pool in DeFi, you're now subject, likely. Um, maybe it could be that Bitcoin core developers at some, in some level 
this gets approached and directed towards them, that's still to be seen. It's unsure, but this is, this is what this does. And like what we're seeing now is basically a way of suppressing the whole ecosystem and basically a drag net of saying like, we can now throw the widest blanket possible to regulators, let regulators do whatever they feel is necessary to like reduce the velocity of acceleration of the space that's currently happening right now. Um, that's the takeaway I would have. And so like, to the extent that people care, um, that's what we're trying to fight for. Right. And, and that's, I think the most important thing that we have in the space to fight for now is like openness, privacy, and like, you know, innovation, cause this kills innovation, right. Um, it gives the banks very good competing advantage. Um, and it gives the established like institutional space much more of a stronger foot. Uh, on our ecosystem, um, but it kills innovation. So, 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 just to kind of now move into like again the shift side of things. So, how is it that shift addresses these concerns? How is it that uh, you know to the best abilities or whatever? I mean, um, and, yeah. and also if you can maybe touch on like because I know maybe we touched on this last time, but I think it's important to reiterate that that, that shift has nothing to do with your driver's license or whatever, right? No. I think when people think about identity and it's like, oh, am I, am I putting my KYC on a blockchain? It's like, nah. <laughs> Um, but, no. but but yeah, maybe maybe kind of help us kind of figure out now or understand rather like how does how does shift help us maintain sovereignty, privacy, you know, and in this yeah. world. And, and and again, like to me, the story really sounds like one of, you know, they say seek first to understand, then to be understood. Right. So it's like uh, like the lens that we had through yeah. Toronto and, and is here is, is we, we were really ground zero with, you know, a lot of the other projects like Ethereum and whatnot. Yeah. And then simultaneously, you had kind of an insight into well, what regulators were thinking. And it was this like marriage of, I guess, these two worlds trying to figure out like, how do you maintain, yeah. you know, how do you protect? How do you make sure that if there is some terrorist or some dude doing something super like bad, I don't know, with kids or whatever, you know what I mean? Like there, there's things that in this world that all of us do agree that, you know, we Shouldn't probably want be. less of. Okay. It's like, well, that's. Yeah. I mean, I know it could be argued that the way they're doing it is maybe not the most effective with all the breaches yeah. and the identity, identity, but like, but, but, but you could understand society's need to try and prevent, you know, these types of activities. So, so yeah. how do you, how do you, how do you then back into a problem set like that? It sounds like oil and water. Yeah. Yeah. Like I, we kind of took this approach of like, okay, in the future, there will be uh, a way of proving my identity without having to give all of my data right like that was like the core initial thesis like okay we need to build systems that can write a proof an encryption code some way an attestation is what we call them a metadata packet that basically says i am a person this other person has or entity has validated that i'm a person there's other ways of proving identity cryptographically than putting all my data on it blockchain or, or 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 even handing over a piece of paper and and assuming it's valid right so that was like the core like thesis that we had like four years ago what was like okay there's new concepts that will come out that will allow us to verify people without eliminating the privacy um that both you know public networks have and and and, and bitcoin private and public keys have or ethereum uh, and smart contracts can be very useful for this so that was the the core base um Basically what like shift is, is it's an attestation network. It's a data like information uh, request metadata layer. So it's really building this like opt-in compliance uh, infrastructure and this opt-in identity layer, right? This metadata identity layer. So what that means is like I as an exchange or I as a DeFi DAP or I as a third party that can, has data on a user today can verify or validate and write these encrypted um, verifications to a public address, once it's Sonny's public address, that says, you know, we're not going to expose all my PII, but we're going to make it such that that public address has a lot of features on it that prove that this is a person and through requests for information, Sonny's in control of that information, but Sonny can now give consent that you're okay with exposing that information. Um, so it's a way of saying like, we're not going to make this a big open field day. Everyone's just sharing information like crazy. There's bigger honeypots being created. That's what governments are doing and they'll probably continue to require us to build honeypots. Um, but like there is a system that we as users can have consent in. We can ensure that there's public and private key cryptography securing information uh, and the requests for information and that we can start building systems in the space 
that work across smart contracts, that work across opt-in DeFi projects. It can build compliant liquidity pools. It can build new types of DEXs. Uh, it can solve the travel rule requirements and do so without centralizing all of the space, de-anonymizing the privacy that, that we have today and allowing uh, different data sources, exchanges and other intermediaries to act as our data custodians at the request of users um, and, and enabling uh, or maintaining privacy. Um, that's like kind of the goal, if that makes sense. Um, and so just to be clear on one thing that you said PII, that means personal identity information, or is that what it's personally for? identifiable information, identifiable so, information, your driver's license, yeah. your passport or something like that, right? Anything that would put like your first name and last name on, right. into the public is a no go. Right. So that doesn't enter maintain, the system. Right. No, we need to maintain confidentiality, right? We need to enable the same information that's publicly viewable in a Bitcoin transaction is the only information that should be publicly viewable on a identity transmission. Uh, and so, so if you had to pick two point. words, would you say decentralized SWIFT? Is that kind of like, a, like, I mean, if you had to pick two words, like, you know, yeah. to describe it type of deal, it's kind yeah. of that, right? Interesting, fascinating. So, um, and, and one more thing before we move on to the topic. So, uh, it doesn't only have to uh, have to apply to crypto, right? Like, you know, in Canada, mm. cannabis was recently legalized and it boggles my mind that even the Ontario cannabis store, like the one that's run by the government, all you do is just type in your age or your birthday and you get to get in. Like, there's no, like, there's no proper like identification even going on there. And then when yeah. you go to every store, it's different. So, so I, I wonder if like shift could unify, you know, PII information across other industries as well. It seems to be a definite disconnect, no? Yeah, it's like, it's like we need standards, right? And we need us like one size won't fit all like in to the extent that we can build incentives our ecosystem again is really good at building economic incentives and to the extent that we can maintain privacy and build a really easy to use system you know the best way to start that is to address our compliance requirements that 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 unfortunately like actually have a user impact and it's the stickiest way of us saying listen we can enable a system that does provide privacy on our most important things keep our ecosystem functioning and the offsets of that are you know, national identity systems become possible uh, at the request of users. Um, different types of industries can all utilize that system. It really builds or bootstraps this global identity infrastructure. Um, yeah, and uses crypto to do it. So maybe, maybe if you could talk a little bit about like what are the without naming maybe I mean we've already named a few big you know exchanges obviously but what are the two or three different categories um, of partnerships or whatever of like entities that are looking to plug into this network? Yeah, like the the core team right now is like pretty much um, finished its like primary directive, which is like hey we the the goal for the the initial like you know consolidating team was build all the infrastructure, respond to these like challenges and do the best to get everything out. Right. And, and the Federation, which we can talk about in a minute, uh, is really now designed to like carry the protocol forward now and, and really run on this. And then we can walk through that. Um, but I would say that um, the, the three areas that the Federation members uh, or what will be the foundation uh, will focus on are, are, are DeFi um, as one piece, uh, which is the question of like, we need to look at compliant DeFi and we need to look at options for institutional you know, players, regulated intermediaries, uh, which a lot of the world's you know, money managers are. Um, and also those systems solve the regulatory problem that regulators are having uh, where they're forcing us to make these crazy uh, guidance requirements. So that's kind of one piece. How do you integrate with DeFi? How do you give options to people? It's not a one size fits all. People should have privacy options. They should have a compliant option as well. Um, so that's kind of one vertical. The other one is we have some pretty big enterprises uh, that will come out in the next, like, I think month um, that are like really using the travel rule to enable global adoption. It's pretty amazing to be honest. Like um, I can't talk about them directly, but like we're noticing that like when you solve compliance, you see mass adoption happen really fast. Uh, right. And so big, you know, payment companies and, and financial institutions are really uh, now able to like go full force, enable payments, enable all these types of transacting abilities on Bitcoin, on different cryptos, because you've addressed the travel rule. Right. So we look at it as like an opportunity. We're like, OK, if we solve this unfortunate problem, don't destroy privacy for people. 
well, we can enable massive adoption across the space that is like, you know, orders of magnitude bigger than what we have today. Um, and that is important. That's the whole point of us being here, right? Is to get larger adoption. And that's just the nature of it. Regulation enables more adoption. Um, so the institutional side has been pretty important and really interesting the last six months, I would say. Um, and then the last piece is the centralized side is like, how do we make sure that uh, the exchanges, the on-ramps, the lifeblood of our space that enables liquidity uh, and first-time user generally to onboard um, maintains, you know, their <laughs> their uh, their position um, and doesn't get run over uh, or blocked or shut off or 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 the inability to transact, which kills our user growth. Um, so those are like the three main areas: like centralized exchanges, crypto only institutional side governments, I think is an offset of that too. We've been working on identity systems with Bermuda uh, and a few other countries um, probably over the next year. Um, and then the last one is the DeFi side. And like, how do we, how do we use one infrastructure to layer across everyone, right? That's what Shift is all about is this, it's a shared multi-sided market infrastructure. So it addresses all of these primitive challenges for all of these user groups. And it makes it so that it, it makes it useful for everyone. Uh, that was kind of the, the goal and that's what the mission is. So I think the centralized exchange thesis, and we kind of talked about that in our last call, I think it's becoming more uh, maybe understood by people. And it's kind of, you know, Brian Armstrong, like I mentioned, talked about it. I think, you know, all the exchange owners are talking about it. What's maybe not so obvious is this, what you just kind of alluded to this, 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 this notion of compliant DeFi, right? Um, that sounds like a bit of an oxymoron. When I, if I ever mention that to anyone or even think about it, it's like, what, like the reason people like dexes and all this stuff is because there's no DeFi, sunny like don't you get it like what are you living under a rock um and so what is it that maybe people might be missing uh in terms of a uh, hello like where is this bull run coming from it's coming from institutions right yeah and institutions absolutely. need to know their counterparties uh, to some extent yeah. and so 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 it's a, maybe maybe if you can help me lay out I, and i know we were i was going to talk about the federation stuff first but it's just you mentioned it so i wanted to dig in a bit deeper in terms of like what mm. the hell does that mean compliant DeFi? <laughs> yeah like and again users have never had to deal with this right like these are all new things so like what most people in the space don't really, yes, the, the bull run today is largely led by institutional adoption. We have regulated entities like the Coinbase's of the world that are now able to onboard the Teslas of the world at scale, right? Everyone like, like prefers privacy as this option and Bitcoin is this freedom mechanism, I think largely, but then everyone also like needs the compliant regulated side like the Coinbase's or Gemini's to drive you know, real scale, right? That's where all this, the trillion dollar market cap comes from, um, at least for Bitcoin and the rest of the rest of the space. So um, what we didn't, what we, most of us don't realize is that DeFi will be hindered um, in its growth by this question around counterparty identification. So uh, the way that Coinbase works is I have a KYC user and another one, they're all KYC. The majority of people in that exchange are KYC'd so I can actually trade in that, um, that entity because we know that every person in that entity has been KYC. And this is this problem, what's called the poison well problem. If there's one user that isn't KYC, it poisons the well for all of the other institutional capital, right? And like, we, we wouldn't think about this, but DeFi has this huge problem it's like, like if you're a lending company, you can't go and give institutional loans today because you don't know if that's, that money is laundered money, if it's actually from you know, human trafficking. We don't know if you know, liquidity pools and Uniswap like actually is like you know, drug trafficking capital flows. We have no idea, it's all anonymized. And so when you think about what drives mass adoption and mass financial growth in our space, the largest market makers are not able to participate today inside the DeFi space. Uh, the largest institutional um, people uh, and institutions, like from a lending perspective, capital markets, everyone is excluded, right? And and that's the opposite of like crypto. The crypto, like the I don't know. The reason why I got into Bitcoin eight ten years ago was like it's about optionality. It's about choice. Like people need the ability to choose. Our ecosystem is about giving more options, not giving one option and saying this is the only option. Take it or leave it. Um, and that has like impacts and effects on. Do regulators just kill our space? Well, if there's an option like a compliant DeFi liquidity pool, 
or there's, you know, there's other types of infrastructure. Well, maybe they don't have to kill everything. Maybe they can say, well, we suggest that this is the preferred method for regulated entities and the banks, you know, uh, can use that type of option, right? So it increases liquidity because there's more participation. And like, that's the big thing that we don't recognize in the space is that, you know, Bitcoin success is because of it. And like the rest of the ecosystem needs these more options, both for, you know, for the new participants uh, to address regulatory concerns and to build new markets and new market structures and everything. And people who think this is like some sort of fringe thing, isn't it true? I thought I saw an article last week that Binance hired or is also now working with, I guess, Shifts advisors, Rick, Rick and Jose or something like that. Oh, I think I got you on mute. Oh, whoops. Um, yeah, I mean, like we, listen, we want to be helpful. Like, you know, the, the team that we built, um, you know, came from regulatory backgrounds. We knew that we needed to bring the people that believed in our space from the, you know, the heads of the FATF and like the heads in policy to the table to say, listen, like we need to fight for the ecosystem too. And, and we need to balance here. Right. Um, so yeah, so Rick and Jose, who've been, uh, they were the chair of, of the FATF for many years, at least at the secretariat, are now helping the uh, ecosystem that we have on shift, right? So there's been many exchanges that are uh, working on shift and writing policy around shift and, and really running governance of what we call Veriscope, which is a project on shift. That's to address the travel rule, this decentralized SWIFT infrastructure. Um, and now those advisors or the, the chairs of that are now moving into Binance and to other exchanges to make sure that we get this right um because it's coming quickly and like we need to you know ensure stability uh so interesting we're just trying to help we're trying to help yeah 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 no i know i know i mean i i know i can already like hear the the trolls and and the, and, and the funny thing is i consider myself a bitcoin maximalist even though some may disagree right but it's like you know uh you got to do what you got to do and and like uh Oh, it is a lot harder um, when you're actually building things. You know what I mean? It's yes. so easy to just be like a troll on Twitter that like is just like kind of doing this in the peripheral. But when you're in the space, um, you're always juggling between, you know, what's like morally right, like what's what's going to keep us alive, like what's going to help us thrive. Um, hey, because you brought up, you know, Veriscope, I think this is a good time to maybe quickly touch on the Federation and like what mm -hmm. that even means. And, you know, because it's an important part of shift right because it is these the, these these entities are um and then, then like the whole idea of nodes and and yeah if you can maybe i don't know touch on some of that yeah so like and this came from a lot of like lessons again being early in the space and a lot of the early architects of like new types of systems like in our ecosystem right like our view is that it is wasteful for to have another proof of work system you know bitcoin's proof of work is like by far the greatest security architecture we have in the world today um <clears throat> ethereum of course has copied that and done very well um but we don't believe that like there will be room for more pow systems and in the early parts of shift we kind of questioned it we're like okay like we could see this happening the, the closer we got into it we realized like this doesn't really make sense for the for the problem that we're trying to solve um and shift is really built for purpose it's not this general you know, throw all dApps into a world computer. It's It's got few things that it does exceptionally well. It was built and designed for these types of, of scenarios that the majority of the world has the problems of. Um, and so like, when we looked at it, we said, okay, like we, we were doing a lot of work early on with Blockstream, um, as you know, of course, Sunny as well. Um, and, and this concept around like federated systems, you know, effectively uh, either layer two systems that would act as, effectively formally side chains um, were really probably the best security model, right? And so the concept around a federation is that you build a system with rule sets, you have a distributed group of counterparties, those counterparties do have the aligned incentives of the system, uh, they are, you know, um, censorship resistant in their distribution, um, you write a sec you write transactions to the Bitcoin network or to the Ethereum network as a way to provide external security. Um, you're not having to use proof of work uh, as a function, um, but you're enabling the same security guarantees as these systems. And, and we looked at this for a long time and we did a lot of work on it early on. And we recognized that this was probably the best situation, right? Like shift is, shift is a situation where you can have identities 
rolling back, right? Like in, in Bitcoin and everything, you can do rollbacks. And that's the point of like chain reorganizations. If you did that in shift, you'd lose your identity, right? Or like something could go catastrophically wrong and like information gets re, re, reordered. And that's like really bad. Um, and so the, the Federation was designed to enable that. Um, the Federation today has basically taken over all the decision making. They are running consensus. Uh, the next two weeks, everything. Uh, the next two weeks, everything will be completely out of our hands. It already largely is. Uh, we really tried to build everything ahead of time so that you know the moment that we launched, like everything was uh, as open and distributed as possible, um, and that the federation can control and, and and work with the community. To be honest, um, and, and ensure that they're they're uh, they're they're listening and responding as service providers. Uh, we're all here as a you know we're doing service to the community and that's the role of the federation and us as well so um yeah that's kind of the breakdown who's a part of the federation are you able to mention is that public yet or not? i don't really? think it is yet oh, okay um, okay just exchanges uh, i, I guess we can leave it at yeah, that i think that, like in the next week or two they're all gonna oh. be coming out oh there's yeah. some news okay interesting okay so people can yeah. keep an eye out for that yeah and it's actually a really cool party it's like you know, you have a, an amazing distributed set of different incentives, different alignments. Um, yeah, it's a really, it's a, it's an interesting group. I don't know all of them, to be honest, uh, but the ones that we do know are, uh, are interesting. So yeah, in the next two weeks, everything is going live and everything's getting pushed out. Um, so they'll be more vocal. Yeah. yeah uh, one of the things is like, you know, um, there are other projects out there, maybe not too many, maybe a hand, maybe one or two, right, that mm -hmm. are trying to solve the same problem at scale. Um, you know, if you had to kind of, and we've touched on it a little bit here and there, but like if you had to kind of close a loop on that in terms of what's so different about this project, you know, um, can you maybe just like help people get their head around that? I mean, uh, I think yeah. just the fact that it's open and it's like a blockchain is, is I think fundamentally different. Right. But, but is that, is that the main, would you say the main difference and in, in kind of how you guys thought through this problem set? Yeah. I would say like really simply decentralized versus centralized, like every other solution that's addressing identity requirements requires a centralized set of like source, right. Uh, that dictates who does onboarding, who's allowed into the system, if you're solving the travel rule, everyone does have a centralization requirement. Um, it's, you know, central databases, et cetera. We tried, to, we tried to take this position of like, build the way our ecosystem is designed. Build the smart contracts to run across all smart contracts. Build on public and private key infrastructure to be able to fit in and layer to all of our ecosystem, right? Like use the privacy advantage our ecosystem has use the uh, federation like designs that our ecosystem designed them for um, really like meet our ecosystem where it's at and how do we translate that infrastructure to also meet institutional requirements right um, and so it's kind of like we can now bridge that the infrastructure that makes our ecosystem powerful into the traditional world and that's just not the way that people have thought about this um, the other thing too is like in every category there's a competitor uh, with the exception of the compliant DeFi side that's just so new that it's not um, I think too understood yet. Um, but I would say in identity, there's competitors and in the travel world, there's competitors, but there's no system that is like a multi-sided market infrastructure that is fully on chain and that runs and actually gets stronger through all of its use cases. So shift aggregates all of these use case problems together. And so it makes a much stronger overall system through all of its, its usage effectively. And that's not any way that, you know, Crypto allows us to think differently and build differently. And when we fully build the way that our ecosystem enables, you get really interesting differences like shift. Uh, that's just not how any other people have built in this space in this, this area today. Um, and I think it'll solve a lot of our, our incoming privacy and, and, uh, and travel rule or FATF problems. And, and, and that's going to touch everyone. So Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is fascinating. Hey, um, yeah. just to kind of maybe uh, this has been, I mean, this kind of went really fast, uh, but but I was going to say is, is that um, do you want to maybe touch on like the roadmap as well? What's like, like, what does it look like over the next few months for the project? Like what, what are, yeah, you mentioned the three different categories of partnerships. I guess that's going to be key, but, but yeah, but what, what are you guys kind of focused on? What is the team focused on? Yeah. So <clears throat> right now it's like, I think there's a big emphasis on, 
the Federation and just getting everything security functions are done. And uh, there's a, been a wide set of distribution and they're just running pass and fails around whether they're going to launch, like what, when they're ready to launch. Uh, so we're kind of just watching as our roles are primarily to be helpful to the Federation at this point. Um, so that's something that should happen in the next few weeks. Um, there's a lot of rollouts that will happen around this bootstrapping of compliant liquidity pools. So we have a lot of infrastructure on this like wrap yield architecture. The idea is like we want to allow the open um, automated market makers and uniswaps and everything to be able to bootstrap compliant liquidity pools. So that'll probably be the next big thing that comes out um, and just allowing the ecosystem to start playing with a lot of the infrastructure more than, than, than our initial launch. Um, and then it's continuing to work on the travel rule. Like I think as the exchanges start to really get pressure, we're responding to that. You know, there's a lot of them in testing, a lot of them in integrations currently as the biggest guys in the room, if you will. Um, and they have to start addressing their problems. So that's where Veriscope's working. Um, and I would say that there's a lot of bridging infrastructure and the Federation will be pushing a lot of privacy upgrades and updates and um, a lot of the government projects will start going live probably in Q2. Um, and yeah, there's like just things are starting to happen all over the place and less of us doing everything at this point and um, just, yeah, starting to focus on community, I guess, more too. So Cool. That's amazing. Well, I think we covered a lot of ground. Um, I don't want to overwhelm people too much. You know, we touched on compliant DeFi, which I think is a very unique idea. And, you know, just to reiterate one thing, you know, what we're talking about though is like these opt-in compliant pools, yeah. right? Like these are, this has nothing to do with like, you know, if people are doing their thing on, on Bitcoin people. or... Yeah, forcing people to do anything, yeah. right? These are like, no. I mean, we should, I mean, if we believe in freedom, then well, I guess we should also uh, honor Choice. the fact that other people are willing to give away their KYC in lieu of some service or some offering. And for those who choose to, if they're able to get better rates or be a part of some pool that, you know, whatever, the, uh, the fact that institutions are coming is not like a thing anymore. Like Tesla just yeah. like, literally signaled to the world a month ago that, you know, they're going to put Bitcoin in their balance sheet or whatever it is. Just insane. Now they're what accepting Bitcoin for the sale of their cars. They're not going to sell it. They made upgrades to BTC pay server yesterday. Like, is this even real freaking life? Like, who knows? Um, you know, and then and then there's this like odd like quagmire of these like kind of like companies like PayPal and Wealthsimple that are like do, kind of launching these like closed garden, right, type of environments. And and one of my fears is that the crypto world ends up like that. Is it Me is too. it going too far to say that shift maybe even enables companies like those to now say, hey, wait, maybe that's exactly we can understand our counterparties and therefore we can allow our users to take their Bitcoin or Ethereum or whatever the heck NFTs off our platform and somewhere else like the internet should work. Like that's exactly what it is. I, I literally say that shift is a response to the attempt at full centralization, right? Like custodialization, full institutional centralization of the space, the closing off of openness Shift is the, as an industry response to saying, no, 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 we can solve all these problems and we can keep everything in channels open. Like it, we, that's the, the core piece. And so, yes, all of these guys can, can maintain openness. They can actually now build as the biggest institutions, they can now build towards thinking of openness because now they've addressed these compliance concerns, right? It's so um, fascinating. So that's why yeah, I say it's, it's the most counterintuitive project. No one would have, yeah. And I think identity outside of money is is probably one of the most important things, right? Like you want to walk into a club, you know, you want to get married, you want to go to a different country. I mean, it's it's all about your identity, right? And identity yeah. seems so effing archaic, like the way we like approach it as humans. It's just like the same type of feeling I used to get about money like 10 years ago before I discovered Bitcoin it's just more and more you realize that identity needs to be rethought. And um, you know, there's a bunch of things. Um, I wonder if maybe we should save this one for the next one or not, but I also kind of wanted to touch on like this discovery layer type of idea. You know, maybe that's something we can, you know, touch on on the next one, uh, but just like, you yeah. know, and, and I think how shift is approaching discovery and how, you know what I mean? Like how by working with these exchanges, you're creating this like first, 
uh, it's like creating this, I don't even know what you're to call it, um, a trust network or whatever, where you're, you're, you have all these entities now that can trust one another or know who they're dealing with. And you're essentially leveraging that to now enable innovation everything right? in the else. open in yeah. the open world so i think we, we can maybe dig into it next time if you know i know, I know we've yeah. kind of covered a lot of ground but um it's hmm. kind of like bootstrapping a decentralized identity system and a compliance uh option into the into the ecosystem by uh relying on the trust and verification of it's like bootstrapping using the databases of every exchange right yeah, but we can get into that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Let's let's say that. that for another one. Um, like yeah. I said, so congrats on all the success. And I've now, you know, I've been helping more closely as well over the last few months to shift. So really, really smart team. You know, if you, I don't think people realize as well is like, like I think you kind of alluded to this, but like the like the the, the gentleman who architected Liquid for Blockstream that everybody's now, you know, raving about. What like six years in or whatever. I think it took some time, but. You know that is a, a federation, right? And 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 yep. there's that same individual that kind of helped you guys with uh, shift, and and it's a model that again I I don't I hate the word blockchain because it's like I just cringe because everybody's throwing it at everything, but there comes a time, um, and I think on a call in the last few days you were saying how, uh, you know, people don't necessarily like in this space one exchange does not trust the other one. Yeah. Right. And so by creating a network that enables them to fulfill their regulatory obligations while without trusting without having to trust one another, again, it's like a problem set that that you know blockchain solves. So why not? Um, yep. okay, Joseph, any closing remarks before we uh close this one out here? Anything else you want to leave with people in terms of uh our no, I mean I think that's it. I mean, lots of stuff happening and we should do these more often. It's fun. Uh, I'm game, dude. Once a week, let's yeah. go. We could even Let's diverge a win, but, you know, we could talk I'm about in. recent events. There's always shit going down, yeah, right? Like, like just think of it. This is the last time we talked. How many things have happened in this space? It's, it's insane. It's insane. Yeah. It's crazy. Um, it's crazy. No, but I mean, I think I'll leave everyone with like, it's important to educate yourself, right? Like if, you know, this is impacting your children and, and the children's children. This will literally impact generations to come. And like this FATF stuff is like right in our faces. And, uh, you know, learn and like try to, you know, be supportive and, and don't knock it before you, you understand it and, you know, try to just, you know, know what the impact will be for, for the future. So no, yeah, so it's, it. it's nuanced. There's a lot to it. Yeah. <laughs> cool, for man. Sure. All right. Thank you very much, Joseph. I guess I'll bring this one to an end and just hang out for 10 seconds. 